Contrary to Hollywood's many fanciful, farcical depictions, ghosts are generally not monstrous, malicious, or even particularly mysterious. They are simply recently deceased, disembodied souls lingering around the physical plane. In fact, the only difference between a ghost and a person in the OBE state is that an out-of-body traveler can return to their physical body, whereas a ghost cannot. In death, the silver cord that connects astral travelers to their physical bodies, that life essence is severed, and the disembodied consciousness can no longer return. The Bible even mentions this in Ecclesiastes 12, 6, and 7. Remember him before the silver cord is severed, or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring, or the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Adrian Cooper wrote, Although ghosts are very real, they are almost always completely harmless. A ghost is, after all, quite simply a totally normal but deceased human being, living within a more subtle body. But after having experienced physical death, for some reason, they become trapped in the lowest part of the etheric plane, closest to the physical world. There are many reasons why deceased souls fail to smoothly transition from out of their bodies and the physical plane. Some people dying from sudden accidents, murder, or heart attacks, for example, do not realize they have passed on. Other people simply will not accept that they have died and cannot return to the physical. Some are so attached to the material world and addictions like sex and power that they refuse to move on. Others are attached to certain relationships or harbor guilt they feel must be reconciled. David Icke wrote, The true nature of death, in fact a seamless transition from life to life, was portrayed so well in the 1998 Robin Williams film What Dreams May Come. It is simply a withdrawing from the biological computer and therefore the frequency range or dimension in which the computer operates. Our awareness then continues its eternal existence in other realms of reality. Several surveys have been taken during the past century in Great Britain and the United States, which have concluded that between 10% and 27% of the general population claim to have had, at least once in their life, a sensory perception, often visual, of another person who was not physically present i.e. ghost, apparition. Many respondents gave startling accounts of recently or sometimes long-deceased people appearing and even interacting with them. For example, one Charlottesville, Virginia woman had told her sick mother on her deathbed when she passed to try and give some signal that her soul lived on. Two days after her mother's death, just after returning from the funeral, she laid down and saw an apparition of her mother's head and shoulders float into the bedroom. She asked her mother if she was in heaven, and her mother smiled and nodded. She asked if her father was there, and again she smiled and nodded, then dissipated and floated out the window. Another woman related a similar story of the day following her husband's death, seeing an apparition of him sitting in his favorite chair. He greeted her nonchalantly with a smile, asked her how she was doing, assured her he was doing fine, then told her where to find the legal papers she would need for finalizing his estate. Adrian Cooper wrote, When the soul of a deceased person remains in a particular locality, a house for example, the soul is known as a ghost, and the location inhabited by the ghost is considered to be haunted. To a physical person living in a haunted house, the ghost will often seem to carry out exactly the same series of actions every time it makes an appearance often at the same physical time of day or night, for example, stepping on a creaky floorboard, walking up the stairs, rattling door handles, moving items around, and even switching lights and other electric appliances on and off. This is possible because the etheric body is already relatively dense by comparison to the inner astral and mental bodies, and a ghost can sometimes achieve the necessary density approaching that of the physical world by absorbing large amounts of etheric energy from their surroundings, sufficient to influence the density of physical objects. My ex, Petra, has seen ghosts as long as she can remember. As a child, she lived in a house long haunted by a female ghost. She and several family members had experiences while wide awake, feeling invisible footsteps on the bed nearly every night, hearing discarnate crying, screaming, or laughter. 
and often seeing clear apparitions of the same long-haired woman. Since then, ghosts have regularly visited Petra during her dream states. The most noteworthy of these visits was from a schoolmate who she saw soaking wet sitting at the end of her bed one night. Pale and shivering, she sat curled up asking over and over for a towel. Petra found out the next day that her schoolmate had just drowned to death last night, shortly before visiting her bedside. David Icke wrote, As I have already outlined, infinite awareness experiences this reality through the body computer, akin to wearing a genetic spacesuit. Our lower levels of awareness can, and mostly do, become confused and identify with the computer. When the computer, body, ceases to function, or dies, our awareness is released from the illusion and starts the process of remembering who it really is. This can be instant for those who were aware of their true identity before computer death, while for others it can take longer if their incarnate awareness has become utterly dominated by its computer identity. It is for this reason that there are so many stories of ghosts that haunt locations where they once lived. What we call ghosts are often discarnate entities aspects of awareness who are still identifying themselves with the computer they once occupied and they live in a limbo land dimension very close to this one. Instead of understanding what is happening at death, when infinite awareness is released from the computer reality, ghosts go on believing that the earthly self is who they are. Some people call them earthbound souls, or lost souls. Such is the identification with the former computer self that they manifest as a mental projection of what they once looked like in physical form. It is what they called in the Matrix movies, residual self-image. David Icke related an interesting story after the death of his mother. Her funeral was due to begin at 11.30 a.m. the next week, and every day before, during, and even after the funeral, several strange things happened. At precisely 11.30 a.m. each day, the electrical equipment, TV, Watches and mobile phones in his house would turn themselves on and off. One day, emergency services called him at 11.31 and asked why he had just rung them, when, of course, he had done no such thing. David Icke wrote, Often, a departed loved one will try to manifest signs to show that they have not ceased to be. When we are operating on other dimensions, the easiest way to have an influence in this world is via electrical equipment through a vibrational connection that affects electrical circuitry. People can stop watches by projecting their thoughts because thoughts are electrical and vibrational phenomena, hence brain waves, and they can be used to block the watch's electrical circuits. Such thought waves can also be projected from other dimensions into this one and have a similar effect. When this happens, people will often say that a place is haunted. In November 1967, in a haunted Rosenheim Bavaria law office, some of the best documented ghost and poltergeist activity was witnessed by over 40 scientists and professionals. Over several days, they recorded paranormal phenomena such as loud sounds from unknown sources, pictures on walls spinning around 360 degrees, light bulbs dimming then brightening and exploding, electrical equipment spontaneously starting up or breaking down, and objects moving or falling without anyone touching them. Also in 1967, American researchers Gaither Pratt and William Roll witnessed and recorded 224 accounts of paranormal activity at a warehouse in Miami, Florida. Over and over they watched as books and boxes slid around and bottles and glasses flew, dropped and shattered all by themselves. William Roll himself wrote, One time I watched Julio place a ceramic alligator on a shelf when a glass four feet behind him fell to the floor and shattered. Both his hands were occupied. In the right he held the alligator. In the left his clipboard. The two other workers in the room were more than fifteen feet from the glass. They could not have picked it up previously and then thrown it, because we had placed the glass on the shelf ourselves, and no one had been near it since then. The glass was among ten targets we had set out that moved when one or both of us had the area under surveillance and when we were the first to enter the area after the incident. The incident was also among seven when Pratt or I had Julio in direct view at the time. Spiritism, seances, and mediums, due to an unfortunate history of hacks, quacks, and hoaxes, have long been discounted and dismissed as mere tricks and illusions. 
Mixed in with the conniving charlatans, however, have been many famous, scientifically verified and documented cases of actual contact with discarnate entities. Mediums such as Eusapia Palladino, Daniel Douglas Holm, Gordon Smith, and many others have repeatedly produced paranormal phenomena witnessed by teams of scientists and experienced researchers. Phenomena including touches from invisible hands, discarnate voices and sounds, apparitions, psychokinesis, levitation, and manifestations. Stanislav Grof wrote, There is no question that at the time when spiritism enjoyed its greatest popularity, around the turn of the century, many participants were victims of cunning swindlers. However, we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater and conclude that this entire area is nothing but fraud. It is difficult to imagine that so many outstanding researchers would have invested so much time and energy in a field with no real phenomena to observe. There exists hardly any other realm where the expert testimony of so many witnesses of the highest caliber has been discounted as stupidity and gullibility and thus written off. We have to realize that among serious researchers were many people with outstanding credentials, such as the famous physicist Sir William Crookes, the Nobel Prize-winning physician and physiologist Charles Richet, and Sir Oliver Lodge, a Fellow of the Royal Society in England. University of Arizona psychiatry professor Gary Schwartz has performed laboratory studies of several mediums and recorded the results in his book The Afterlife Experiment, Breakthrough Scientific Evidence of Life After Death, and over 450 other scientific papers on the subject. In experiments carefully controlled to eliminate fraud or cheating, Several mediums were able to produce over 80 bits of information about deceased relatives, such as names, jobs, appearance, personal stories, and the nature of death. Combined, the mediums averaged an astonishing accuracy rate of 83%. Gary Schwartz and his team concluded that the most parsimonious explanation is that the mediums are in direct communication with the deceased. Irvin Laszlo wrote, Tested in Glasgow by Roy and Robertson, British medium Gordon Smith performed with the greatest accuracy of anyone yet measured. He achieved 98% success rate with his information deemed specific and accurate under the tight experimental protocol. When asked what, in his view, is his most convincing proof of the continuation of human consciousness beyond the brain, he told of a particular case that he'd been involved with. A woman, Sally, had come to him in great distress to ask if he could help her find her missing son. Without her providing any other information, Smith was able to contact her son, who told him that his name was Blake, and what his mother would find out, she wouldn't like. A message that was sadly true. He went on to say that he had been a soldier training in France, when, after a night out, he had been accidentally killed. He described to Smith the river where his body now lay. All the personal details were correct. A year later, a human thigh bone was found in the exact place where Blake had told Smith he would be. And when the DNA was tested, it proved to belong to Sally's dead son.